The American Basketball Association is the largest pro league in the world. Some great opportunities for team ownership are available and the cost may surprise you. If you've ever thought about team ownership in a pro league, give us the opportunity to help make it a reality. Reach out to us for more info. For US A-teams at www.abaliveaction.com. In Australia, go to www.abaleagueaustralia.com. The best way to keep up with everything happening around here at ABA 101 is to join our monthly newsletter. Just for joining, we give you $230 worth of free gifts from our sponsors once you confirm your email address. You can unsubscribe at any time, but why would you? Just go to our website, www.aba101.club, scroll to the bottom of the page, and subscribe. You're listening to ABA One-on-One Podcast. Hey guys, it's time for a new episode of ABA One-on-One. This week in the house, we have Dave Twardzik, uh, Portland Trailblazers and Virginia Squires in the ABA, Wild with a Legend. Also joined by uh, Brian and Rick once again in the house. And we're going to kick it off by first just welcoming Dave to uh, ABA 101, man. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I mean, I'm following some pretty big names. Woo. Yeah, like Rick Warren. <laughs> oh. Rick Warren, <laughs> you're coming on. Behind, you're coming on behind a legend, back a backyard legend, man. <laughs> if that book gets better after that, I don't know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> Brian, go ahead. Um, welcome, Dave. Welcome. Um, you. you know, uh, it's great to have you on, man. Uh, wow, when I when I when I saw the lineup for today, I was excited. Uh, because I do remember you as a player, especially back with Portland. We used to call you Slick Dave towards it, you know, because you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a uh, I was a Philadelphia um, Sixers fan back then, and uh, I tell you, it, it was a heartbreaking <laughs> series. I can't, I remember it well, but well, great to great to have you here, man. Such a legend. Well, great to have you. Well, the interesting thing is, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania. I. Uh, just outside of Harrisburg in Middletown, Pennsylvania. And um, yeah. I was a, always a Sixer fan. So uh, th- that series certainly had special meaning to me. One, because I was always a Sixer fan. And two, uh, being a former teammate of Doc, uh, it was always nice to, to play against him. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Hey, what was it like playing with the Squires? You know, if it wasn't for the ABA and the Squires, I don't know if I would have made it in the NBA. Um, no, I I was very fortunate. I was a decent player on a very good team when we got out to Portland. And the year I got out there, I had just gone through four years in the ABA, and it was the best thing that I ever could have done. Uh, Portland drafted me. I think I was the 26th pick, which back then was in the second round. And I didn't really know much about the NBA. I knew a lot about the ABA because I went to Old Dominion University, which is in Norfolk, Virginia, and that's where the Squires were based. So I got I had a lot of exposure to the ABA. I actually worked for the Squires. I was uh, uh, my junior year. The Squires moved from Washington down to Norfolk, and scope the building wasn't done, so they played on campus. We had a about a six thousand seat arena. So they played on campus, and I was actually a stat runner. So when you all would have been watching the game and some little guy coming around giving you stats during timeouts and halftime, that was me. I made 15 <laughs> bucks a game and thought I was rolling in the dough. <laughs> so uh, the ABA was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I matured as a person. 
Uh, I mean, I, I was, Old Dominion was a Division II program. I had never dreamt that I would have an opportunity to play uh, after college. So I had an opportunity to play. I proved that I could play in the ABA. And then unfortunately, Virginia was not included in the merger of the four teams from the ABA to the NBA. Yeah. So Portland retained my draft rights and I went out to Portland and our first year there, uh, we had a new coach, two new coaches, a new head coach in Jack Ramsey. Lenny Wilkins was fired. Uh, Jack Ramsey took over. Jack McKinney was his only assistant at the time. And we had seven new players. And um, we all bought into Jack's system. And mm -hmm. we meshed very quickly. And we ended up um, – our, our goal at the beginning of the year was just to make the playoffs because Portland had never been in the playoffs before. So our goal was to get into the playoffs. And then once we got into the playoffs, Jack Ramsey – kind of readjusted our goals is okay our first series it's the mini series against Chicago three games let's beat Chicago then we played Denver well let's beat Denver and then we played LA we swept LA and then we played the Sixers in the finals so uh, I mean it was a it really it was a dream come true and to go from the adversity that the Squires had where they had trouble making paychecks checks were bouncing <laughs> I ended up getting paid here's a great story I, I ended up after my third year, I made the all-star team. And I don't say that to brag. Here's how I won. I got on the all-star team. I think every team had to have a representative at the all-star game. And I was having a, a decent year. But another guy on our team which was George Irvin, not George Gervin, George Irvin. Mm -hmm. We were having comparable years. Virginia Flyers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were having comparable years. So either George or I, we were going to, one of us was going to go to the all-star game. I tell people I lost the flip and I had to go. And <laughs> so uh, I end up after that year, I signed a three-year contract for 70, 80, and 100. And I, I, after I signed it, I looked at my wife. I said, Kathy, I just signed for $250,000. Well, I got 30000 of that. Oh my so uh, <laughs> I ended up going to the um, NBA. We win a championship my first year, fell in love with Portland, and never thought we would leave. Wow. Oh, unbelievable. You know, you know, Dave, uh, growing up in Virginia, I, don't get, uh, I saw the Squires play quite a bit. I lived near Roanoke, and uh, I told that story earlier. I saw Julius Servin play his first ever game against the Kentucky Colonels in the Roanoke Civic Center. Yeah. And he, he, he dunked on Artis Gilmore. Uh, that's my, that was my first recollection. I was in junior college. It was 1971. Well, Rick, um, I, my first year in the league, I graduated from Old Dominion in 72. So my first year was Doc's second year. Yeah. My first year with the Squires, I was playing, I don't know, 15, 18 minutes a game. But I'd be sitting on the bench, and Doc would do some stuff at practice. <laughs> and if you and I were sitting next to each other, I would bruise you with some of the stuff he made and my reaction. They're like, can you believe he did? Oh, my God. And now <laughs> what, what the public saw in the game was only kind of the tip of the iceberg of what he used to do at practice because Al Bianchi was our coach, and back then – Al was probably the best coach I'd ever been around for handling personnel. He was decent with X's and O's, but handling personnel, he was unbelievable. Wow. Our practices would be, okay, you shoot, you come out, you shoot around for about 25 minutes before practice, two lines, the shooting line, a rebounding line. You do three lines, fast break, and then uh, three on two fast break drills. And then we basically went over our offense for about 15 minutes defensive concepts for 15 minutes, and then we scrimmaged for about an hour. Some of the stuff Doc did at the scrimmage cannot be described. That's how good he was. <laughs> was Charlie Scott on that team, Dave? Charlie left the year I came. So he left okay. and he jumped to Phoenix uh, towards the end of – my senior year at Old Dominion. So my first year at Old at Virginia, he was uh, playing for the Suns. Okay, okay. But you talk about some talent going through Virginia. I mean, you had you had Charlie, 
Rick Barry was actually on the team and didn't want to move down to Virginia. Because he didn't want his kids to say y'all. Yeah. And then his, his son, I believe a couple sons went to Georgia Tech. I, I'm not real good in geography, but I think that's a little farther south than Virginia. Uh, Rick. So Charlie, Charlie Scott, George Gervin, Don. Patty Taylor. Gwen Nader. I mean, there was some unbelievable talent on that team. Wow. And then some of the – some of the players in the NBA that Earl Foreman had lined up to jump from the NBA to the, uh, to the Squires, I don't even know if the public knows some of those players. I mean, it was unbelievable if he would have been able to get everybody he talked about. Oh, he was definitely an innovator. Oh, man, he sure was. And but the unfortunate, unfortunate thing is his pockets weren't real deep. <laughs> And you need some deep pockets uh, to get involved in the uh, in the NBA and back then the ABA because there was no TV revenue. And uh, yeah, right now, TV revenue is the lifeblood of the NBA. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. You guys had some fantastic teams back then, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a, a, you know, history buff, and I love talking about the – the, the game in itself and, and like the the innovation that the ABA brought to today's game, um, you know, because a lot of games or a lot of leagues around the world pretty much are using a lot of the ABA influence in the games that they play worldwide. I, do you think that the NBA, and, and, and you just mentioned about that, you know, the NBA, their, their lifeline is the, TV rights. Do you think that the NBA would be further ahead if they had have incorporated more teams from the ABA? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because they were, the NBA was very reluctant to even talk about the three-point line. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was one of the most entertaining aspects of the ABA. Now, we, we did have a 30-second clock. That Trust me, 30 yeah. seconds never came into play in the ABA. Yeah. We were a run and gun league. <laughs> oh, that, that, oh, that's, yeah. why I went to the, that's why I went to the ABA. They had smaller guards. It was a quicker pace than the uh, NBA. And uh, I was more familiar with the ABA and their players. So that's, they're the three reasons I went to the uh, ABA. But the NBA was reluctant to adopt anything that the ABA did. Finally, mm -hmm. they did the three-point line. And I think we'll all agree that it makes it extremely entertaining. Now, I do think it's kind of gone out of whack. I think the three-point line has definitely hurt uh, a lot of the NBA mentality now because, well, I really like Mike D'Antoni at Houston, but his yeah. philosophy is you jack it up. You get as many shots up as possible. There's no such thing as a bad shot. And – we don't want mid-range shots. You either drive or shoot the three-point line. Well, you know, there's some middle ground there. But I think mm -hmm. the three-point line is something that the ABA was brought to the table that the NBA did not want to even think about for the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. like another saying, certainly... thing that – Greg, I'm sorry. No, you're right. You're right, Rick. I'm, I was just going to say right. it certainly has changed the game um, because, you know, as you look at – just basketball in general around the world, uh, the shot clock, the the entertainment now with the cheerleaders and everything. But the three point line is being played around is being played with around the world. So that you know that that to me, I I appreciate things like that that the ABA has introduced to the game of basketball. Yeah, you yeah. know, one another downside to the three point line before the three point line. When you ran a fast break, you ran to score. So you would run, you'd have your wings wide, and mm -hmm. the old thinking was at the free throw line, you make a V cut to the basket, but you ran to the basket to score. Now mm -hmm. you have guys running to the corner to the three-point line, or they start <laughs> yeah. to slow down yeah. at yeah. the wing at the three-point line. So now you don't have real fast breaks. You have guys decelerating at half court to get their feet and their steps down so they can shoot a three-point shot, whether it's from the wing, the three-point line, or the deep corner. So it's kind of been a double-edged sword. It's been good, but there's also been some bad to it also. Hmm. 
Absolutely, Dave. That is a that is a great point. That is a great point. I've seen some college teams do that. I, I told some people that used to be they would run to the rim, run to the front of the rim, and now they're getting running to the three point line, hoping to get a pass, and get your feet set to shoot shoot threes. That's that is so true. Yeah, and Rick, I don't know if that mentality is showing our age or not, but I'm kind of proud to be old school. I'm I'm 69 and. Uh, I, I wouldn't change the timing of my life or anything other than financially, if I was playing, it might be a little bit better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you know, Dave, uh, Mike D'Antoni is a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, I tell people his, uh, I'm very close to that family and uh, his brother played for us when I was at Coastal Carolina, but I've known Mike for years. I go to their training camp every year, but He's 69. Is, well, actually, I think he's getting ready to turn 70, but he's about our age. He's a year older than me, but he's he's an innovator. I think a lot of it has to do with that Italian uh, pedigree that he had when he was in Italy. I mean, they they, they, they shoot three. And oh, when yeah. You got Harden, when you got Harden and that guy, the group he's got, they've got the team. That's, that's the team they got in Houston. But he's uh, good where he's been. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think offensively he's very creative, although – I don't know if I would like to play with Harden. I'm, I, I come from the Portland school, and, and you all—you mentioned you all were watching the the, the 76ers series. I mean, we had we were very unselfish. We had good ball movement. Now we did yeah. have Walton was he was a little strange. Now I mean, let's not <laughs> deny that. <laughs> but, and, and still is a little strange if you listen to him on the uh, doing color on the radio TV. Yeah, I'm glad but somebody Harden, else said that. Yeah. Oh man. I but, love him though. You gotta love him. But as far as basketball goes, he was if he would have stayed healthy, I think he could have been the second best center to ever play the game. I think Wilt was by far the best center easily. And I think Wilt could have been the best player to ever play. Mm. But uh if had Walton mm. stayed healthy, he rebounded, he blocked shots, he was one of the best passers. Forget about centers, but he was one of the best passers I have ever been around. Plus, you could be a, a great passer, but if you don't have a willingness to pass, he would, that's what he'd look for first. He was looking for the assist first, and then, okay, well, if he didn't get it, then I'd make a little bit of move. I'd shoot a jump hook or a turnaround jump shot, but he was an incredible passer. Wow. I remember, I remember him being a being fantastic using the glass. I'm a yes. big proponent in using the glass, but he, he was that not true, Dave? He was a great shot off the glass. Very much so. There Thank were, God. if he had, Rick, if he had a little angle on the board, yes. he never tried to swish the ball. He always used the glass. And that wow. goes back to the John Wooden, the John Wooden theory. Again, going back to old school. Yeah. Hey, that's how we learned the game. Yeah, exactly. tell us about Mar Maurice Lucas, John. I'm Dave. Ooh. Well, I tell you, a man's man, man, right? So, no <laughs> <question about it. laughs> well, let me just, I'm going to give you two sides of the story. In the ABA, I hated Maurice Lucas because I had to play <laughs> against him. In the NBA, as a teammate, I loved Maurice Lucas. And he, he was a guy that, I don't want to say his bark was worse than his bite because his bite could be. Could be pretty severe, <laughs> but he was such a nice guy off the court. It was unbelievable. Now you mm. step on the court, the paint was his workshop. That was his office, and he would protect you. And if if you got nailed on a blind pick or something, or somebody was roughing you up a little bit, he'd come up to you and go, "DT, bring him by me one time." <laughs> oh my God! Luke would lay him out. They'd call him for a foul, and he'd have that innocent look on his face, like what? And then Who he'd me? Do that little, Who me? Little trot. He'd do that little trot down from the offensive end to the defensive end with a little smile on his face. He was the best teammate. Wow! Wow! And that we had Paul McCaskey and and Greg Kite on. Oh, and yeah. they were telling those stories too, and they were hilarious. Oh, yeah. And the thing uh, with Luke, uh, the big fight in the playoffs with the Sixers and Dawkins. Chuck. 
We had yeah. no idea. We came back to our place to play. I think it was the third game. So it was the first game in Portland and introductions. And all of a sudden, Luke goes down and shakes the hand of Dawkins. Now, I don't know if that did. I don't know if it was premeditated. He certainly never told anybody on the team, hey, during introductions, when I'm introduced, I'm going to go down and shake Dawkins' hand. But, you know, that <laughs> bygones be by. He never did any of that. But he... He trots down there with that scowl on his face and and shakes Dawkins' hand. I really do think that had some effect on them. Wow. Yeah. Oh, did, man. Did it pump him up or did it? <laughs> I think it cut his heart out a little bit. Wow. I think, yeah, I don't I – I didn't think – I don't think he knew what to expect from Luke after that. <laughs> <laughs> Got into his head. You know, that was such a – Man, that was the, I'm just sorry, just real quick. That that series, you know, um, if you think about some of the ABA players that was in that series between Portland and the Sixers, I think you guys it was you know you had Doc, you had yourself, um, it was George McGinnis at the time. You had you had Mo Lucas. You had you know what I mean. You had that Caldwell Jones out there. Caldwell Jones. Caldwell Jones. You know that that type of talent in a NBA final, but you know, these main players are ABA royalty, so to speak, that mm. made that league. I, I, I find that just like I said, I'm a I'm a buff and I when I think about um you know the the the, the guys that come on and we we talk week after week about the influence of the leagues and the conferences and who played what and who did what. You know, because, see, I watched that series. I did. I was a kid right there, you know, in Camden, New Jersey, and I was I was watching that series. And, uh, like I said, we used to call you Slick, <laughs> Slick Barnett <laughs> because, because that was the thing. And, uh, but those, you know, that level of competition or that level of players that all came out of the ABA to play in that, that final series, that's, that's, it's, that's just great. You know, yeah, 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 I think I think that's a very good point. The, the downside to the ABA is we were in smaller markets. Yeah. So the other thing is we didn't have a TV contract. But back then, the NBA, they weren't on TV as much as they are now. I, I can remember when I got so to Portland, we, we were playing some games that were tape delayed and coming on at 11 o'clock at night. So the exposure wasn't there as great as it is now. But the ABA had virtually – no TV exposure. And then mm -hmm. to take your point another step farther, you look at the All-Star game that year of the merger. Half the teams was ABA. Teams, ABA. And yeah. who was the MVP yeah. of the game? Wow. The doctor. Yeah. yeah. So it's an ABA guy. I mean, there were good, good players in the ABA, very good players in the ABA. But we just Artis get, Gilmore. Don't forget exactly. Artis Gilmore. I, I'm going to throw a name out that I, I don't know if you'll ever – you may have never heard of a guy that played at San Antonio, James Silas. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm going to tell you what. Yeah. Played with George Gerben. Yep. Yes. James Silas would have eaten the NBA for lunch. He was that good. But he had knee injury right before the merger, and he never was able to recover from it. Wow. James wow. Silas was – well, I, I'm going to – I have to watch how I phrase this. He was a hell of a player. <laughs> and there were a, a lot monster. of guys like that. Man. How about John Brisker? Oh, Same. Yeah, now, yeah, now he's in another level now. He, yeah. he was not only a good player, physically talented like crazy, but was also crazy. I mean, there's, you talk about unpredictable. There's no telling what Brisker was going to do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, wow. hey, Dave, we, we told that story. I told the story about uh, Marvin Bad News Barnes flying from St. Louis to Memphis, leaving at 12 and arriving at 12. Yeah, the time machine. <laughs> and said he wasn't going to get on no whatever time machine. They rented a limo and drove. <laughs> yeah, old Marvin. Uh, I, every now and then I touch base with Barry Parkhill. He, he fills me in on some Marvin Barnes stories. He was a trip boy. You, you know what I've always wanted to ask him, though? Like, um, when he drove there, what time did he arrive? <laughs> Same time he left. Same time he left. CJ? Uh, 
<laughs> Come on, CK. He arrived at the same time he left. No, no, see, see I, I know that, but I'm wondering what he <laughs> – Oh, my God. <laughs> But Ernie Di Gregorio was a guard on that team, I think. <laughs> I think he was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that's another one. You 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 look at uh, you look at that team, St. Louis. They had some talent on that team. Yeah, they yeah. did. Um, they were they were unbelievable. The Kentucky Colonels, though, I used to I saw them play a couple of times, and they well they were loaded too. I think Dan Issel was playing with them, and Louis Dampier, and boy. Yeah, uh, well, that was one of the the cream of the crop of the ABA. They the won it, didn't they? Always, always one of the best. Yeah, I think they did. Well, Hubie Brown. They ended, up getting, they ended up getting artists for a while. Yeah, yeah, Hubie. Hubie. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of people don't know that. He yeah, was Hubie part of the ABA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. This is, see, I feel like a I'm like a kid in the candy shop listening to you. Dave, to be honest with you, because uh, again, it's just um, it's, it's it's just great getting, and, and I think our our listeners would appreciate, you know, what you're what you're bringing to the table, and you know, really talking about the ABA and you know some of those guys and some of the talent that's that's that that has evolved, and, and that just brought me back to that question that I had asked earlier that you answered because I think that. If the if the NBA had have allowed more teams in, I think the league would even be more different than what it is today, um, because of the talent. And what now wasn't the ABA wasn't the ABA the first league to actually bring uh, kids out of college early, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, I, Dr. I think Dr. Dr. J. I, I think Spencer Haywood before that. Yeah. Wow. Yes, uh, Spencer Haywood, I, I think. Uh, yep, Connie Hawkins. Hawkins. Yeah, Connie Hawkins. Well, Moses. Connie was banned from the Connie was banned from the um, NBA because of some gambling, wasn't it? gambling issue yeah. that turned out wasn't true. Yeah. Uh, yep. But and that was yeah, the prime of his career. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember when I was in high school, we played in the state finals, and we played out in Pittsburgh. And I went, to, uh, we got out there two days before, and it was, I think it was either the Pittsburgh Condors or the Pittsburgh Pipers were playing. Pipers, I can't, the Pipers. I can't, I can't remember who they were playing. But we go to the game, and we were one of very few people at the game. But I remember watching Connie Hawkins. Oh, my God. His hands, <laughs> he yeah. was so fluid moving on the floor. And to me, a great player makes the game look easy. It looked like the game was effortless to him. He was unbelievable. Yeah, exactly right. And it's a shame. It was the prime of his career that he was banned from the NBA. Oh, wow. And the hands on the hawk. The, oh. The, oh, my God. I used to watch some of the video, and it's like he held the ball like it was a, like it was a grapefruit. You oh, know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was Dr. J before Dr. J. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yes, yeah. he but, was. Yeah. But if Dave, I know you know this, but but that's one of the reasons Julius Irvin was a junior at University of Massachusetts, and he came out early because the NBA couldn't take him because your graduating class had to have graduated. Isn't that right? That's exactly right, yeah. And then they started to get around that by saying some kind of hardship <laughs> case coming out of college, and it was just uh, – Kind of window dressing to allow guys to come out after that. Yeah, man. Yeah, See, that, again, yeah. that's another innovation, you know. Um, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, you know, and it's funny when I was when I was in management with whatever team I was with, I, I always was a proponent of players staying in school, and mm -hmm. I was an advocate of that for a couple reasons. One it would be good for their physical maturity. It would be, two, it would be good for their emotional maturity because if they're thinking about coming out and playing in the pros, obviously they were a very good player in high school. They were a very good player however long they were in college. And basketball became their oasis. If they were having problems off the floor, whether it was relationships in their family, with a girlfriend, at school, they could go to the courts 
they would excel and they'd feel pretty good about themselves. So their self-esteem would be built back up again. Had they yeah. left early, now all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's cruel out there. Nobody is really going to help you. A teammate is not going to really help you because now you're messing with my livelihood. I'm not going to make you better and possibly put me out of a job. Take so my minute. Exactly. It, it's kind of a cold business. Now, there are coaches that will help you and everything, but – I just think that a guy staying in school longer, they're going to get better coaching. Their game will get better. They'll get physically stronger. But the big part of it is emotionally they get, they grow up a little bit too. Well, they, Dave, they used to be like some of the players that I used to recruit when I was coaching in college. You know, they, I used to ask them, they said they loved school. It was the classes they had problems with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, the the Sorry. other thing I used to tell guys about staying in school is, you know, you, you might get a four-year contract and you'll get two hundred and fifty dollars or $500,000 a year. You're going to get $2 million. You're going to go through that $2 million. Well, now the money that these guys are making, it's kind of generational wealth. Yeah. I, I think to, to say, tell a guy he's going to stay to stay in school because he's going to go through that money, I, I don't know if that holds true anymore. No, I don't think it does. I mean, the money is just ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, to your point, you know, about the about getting that maturity by staying in school, you know, we, we've had a few conversations here, and, and, and we talked about, um, like, Olympic or Team USA. And, you know, I had a conversation with a couple of friends, and, you know, we, of, we often do this. And my point, I always brought up the point that, you know, our NBA, throughout the history of our NBA, it was built on college players. Right. But as the college system became that one and done, we saw a change. At least I have. I've seen a change in the standard of play with our NBA, especially on the international scene, because I don't think that our players have – been allowed to mature enough I think that we've gone after them early because of talent and you know physically a lot of these players today are way more talented can jump higher run faster you know deeper shooting range but I don't think the 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 mental development is there because of the chase to get them young if that makes sense oh I think that is an excellent point and I agree with you a hundred percent I I would say I would throw another cause why we are not developed as well as the internationals. I think the internationals come over and they are fundamentally sound. Years yeah. ago, when I first started going overseas, I, I went to Charlotte as director of player personnel from 90 to 95. So I started going overseas in the early 90s. And the thing that struck me was these guys are better fundamentally. They're just not as good athletically. So I don't know if they can compete. Well, yeah. now they've closed that gap athletically. But yes. they're still advanced as far as fundamentals go. And, and I really think a big part of that is the AAU program. I, I think the AAU concept, the concept is a good idea. But mm -hmm. let's say I, I was living in Norfolk, Virginia before we moved down to Carolina not long ago. Norfolk, Virginia, you would have a, an AAU team from there, and you would get two players from Norfolk, two or three from Virginia Beach, one or two from Chesapeake, one from Suffolk, two from Hampton, and that would be your team. Now you have no time for practice. You would basically call those eight or nine guys up and say, okay, look, I'm going to pick you up Friday. We're driving up to D.C. We have one game Friday, three games Saturday, two games Sunday. I'll have you back Sunday night. So basically, you're rolling the ball out and letting them play instead of teaching them the game. That's where the internationals have it over us. They are so much better fundamentally than we are. Athletically, close the gap big time, but not there. And your yeah. point about being faster, quicker, stronger, jumps better, 100% you're right on with that. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, hey, guys. Know, hey, guys. You know a lot of – 
Go ahead, Rick. Let, let, me, just make this, let me just make this quick point. I think uh, a lot of this, Dave, and I know you know the AAU coaches, because I've been to a lot, a lot of AAU games and tournaments on the weekends and stuff. A lot of these coaches, I don't really wouldn't call them coaches. They're out there trying to hang out and be be one of the one of the guys and stuff. And they're they're not teaching them basketball. They're teaching these kids. Not no chance. These coaches I, I, are on an ego trip. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think a lot of the coaches are not – one, they don't have time to teach, and two, I'm not sure how they much can. they know the game to teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Great point. Sorry, CJ, didn't mean to interrupt, man. Sorry. I lost my head. All right, man, <laughs> we're going to have to start wrapping it up. We've got, probably got about 45 seconds left, but I do want to – Turn around and uh, thank Dave for giving us his time today. And uh, it's good having Brian and Rick back with us. And guys, um, this has been really good. And it's good to talk about the ABA and the NBA. So uh, thank you for being on the show, Dave. And Rick and Brian, you guys take care. Let's do this again. CJ, hey, when's this going to be live this weekend? As always, bro. <laughs> no, I mean, when's it going to be on, As on the As always, website? bro. This weekend, always. Okay, that's right. Okay. okay. I got you, man. All right, guys. Thanks, Have Steve. a good one. Appreciate hey, this it. Was, any, anytime you want to do this, just let me know. We'll do it. Thank you, Dave. Come explore the No Strings Attached E-News online magazine. Our global array of authors inspire, delight, and educate with practical and entertaining articles. And with Focus On, we help producers of film, web series, and other video content attract a wider audience. Plus, your project can stream on Roku, Apple TV, Fire TV, and more with our media partners E360 TV and NETV. No Strings Attached E-News, focusing on human interest. Advertising available, nsaen.com. Sassy B Worldwide Productions. With over 25 years of entertainment experience, we have done it all. Celebrity appearances, red carpet events, image consultation, and branding design. Our clients range from American football stars to Hollywood celebrities and everyone in between. Want to make a splash in the entertainment industry? Then it's time to get sassy. SassyBeeWorldwide.com well, that's going to do it for this week. Remember, you can keep up with every episode by subscribing via our website. Follow us on social media and tell your friends about us. Next week, new guests, more basketball tips, more basketball stories about the game we all love. Till then, be safe and keep your eyes on the ball. Bone.